which is on odd ones. I would like to call our chair, respected chairpersons, Dr. Sanjay Sharma, Dr. N. Karmakar, Dr. Tapan Kumar Vishwas, and Dr. Gaurav Kaushal. I would like to hand over the session over to our respected chairpersons. Thank you. Uh, by Dr. I.K. Tiwari, and he will be talking to us on nutrition in the Indian patient, balancing TPN and enteral nutrition. Thank you, respected chairpersons. Uh, very good morning to everyone. I know uh, this is early session, morning session. But I believe the message conveyed to few ones can be propagated in a major way if we can. So the nutrition in Indian patient, the balancing act between the enteral nutrition and total parental nutrition. I must say this is an art along with the science. Problem is that we everybody knows nutrition is something that is very, very important. And I believe it is a mandatory thing rather than an optional thing in clinical practice. Either being a medicine person, surgeon, intensivist, our duty is to provide a proper nutrition. Otherwise, a vicious cycle set in, malnutrition, infectious complication, again infection, malnutrition, this cycle will be going on. And ultimately, we're leading with a lot of morbidity and motility. So I will be discussing this nutritional aspect. So what is the principle? The principle behind, and since it is a surgical conference, I have put my talk a little biased toward the surgical aspect. So the principle of this metabolic and nutritional care is, that is a key component of enhanced recovery after surgical program, that is ERAS. Nutritional management is an interprofessional challenge. Why I am telling interprofessional? Being a surgeon, intensivist, nutritionist, you have to talk in the same line. We cannot be differ and jumping for the things. Our goal is same to provide adequate nutrition, which is lacking in our current clinical scenario. This ERASE program also includes a metabolic strategy to reduce the perioperative stress and improve outcomes. So the term what is coming out, that is prehabilitation. That means aims at conditioning metabolic risk for ERAS, meaning a tri-modal approach, which will include the nutrition, physical exercise, along with the stress-reducing psychological component. So different meta-analysis uh, meta showed that this pre-rehabilitation may contribute to decrease post-operative complication along with length of stay, uh, when you are undergoing a major abdominal surgery. So now question is when and whom? As soon as your patient getting admitted in any area, either in ICU or in the ward area, you must have a nutrition plan to your patient. And one thing missing I would like to uh, emphasize that at a time of discharge, when you are giving a proper prescription for the drugs, antibiotics and all, you must have to give a nutritional plan to your patient. That is very, very important in post-operative case. So as I have told you, since malnutrition will impair your cellular Im Im immunity as well as the humoral immunity, it will cause to the infection, increasing the catabolic state making more nitrogen, negative nitrogen balance, again malnutrition, and this vicious cycle will be going on unless you make an interruption. Uh, you can see this picture from uh, article in Critical Care. Every day, you will not believe, every day loss, muscle weight loss is one kg per day. So it is, I am showing a severe form, but usually we notice three to four kg, five kg weight loss in a week or 10 days time in most of the critically ill patients in ICU areas. So without any uh, controversy, enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition, which improves the energy balance, definitely it will improve your patient outcome. So the challenge is in ICU patients typically experience the catabolic stress and up to 60% of the ICU patients suffer the GI dysfunction due to impaired GI motility, digestion or absorption problem. 
And during critical illness, hyperglycemia is prevalent and is associated with adverse outcome. Everybody should agree with these things. So what is the prevalence? If you look this slide, 30 to 55 percent of the hospital patient are malnourished upon the admission. 30 to 55 percent. 33 percent of the severely malnourished patient and 38 percent of the well-nourished patient experience a nutritional decline. So you cannot ignore this one third of your patient, almost uh, 30 to 40 percent of the patient. And many patients continue to lose weight after the discharge. That's why I've told very initially that we should have given a nutritional plan at the time of discharge. And hospital readmission, patient with weight loss are at increased risk of readmission as well if you are not giving a proper nutrition to your patient. So you will getting a lot of guidelines, particularly from the ASPN and ESPN, American Society of Enteral and Parental Nutrition and European Society of Enteral and Parental Nutrition, but we don't have our own guidelines in Indian subcontinent. So this is a very beautifully made practical guideline by Dr. Jatin Mehta and team. It is a uh, national guideline from uh, most of the hospital we participated in this. And I will present two or three slides from that. Uh, they are suggesting for the Indian continent, all critical ill patients should undergo nutritional assessment at the time of admission itself, observe for the sign of malnutrition, and enteral can be started as early as within 24 to 48 hours. And if you are not able to give the enteral nutrition completely by uh, seven days, you have to start TPN, but the ASPN guidelines suggest you should start it after 20, uh, 72 hours itself, which is called supplemental parental nutrition, not total. You have to supplement. And ESPN guidelines suggest five days. But in Indian continent, they are observing at least we have to make it by seven days. Otherwise, you are losing the patient. Hemodynamically stable patient, yes, you start immediately. If you are requiring less than two inotropes, you can start enteral nutrition within 24 hours. But if your patient are in persistent shock, please delay it because of the fear of gut ischemia. If it is inotropy is too high, don't force your patient for uh, enteral nutrition. And whenever feasible, you try to make a muscle mass estimation by ultrasonography or computer uh, CT scan. They are also suggesting in burn and polytrauma, calorie and nitrogen ratio should be 120 is to 1 or even 100 is to 1. And Toronto formula is useful in acute setting but this Herrick Benedict tool is quite complex, time consuming, and sometimes it overestimates. So don't rely on that only. So what to rely? That is the weight-based equation that is more feasible, practical, and we should approach. So what is the goal of our nutrition? Nutrition goal is to prevent the lean body mass, to maintain the immune function, and to avoid metabolic complications. So in modern critical care, the concept is changed. What we used to say that is supportive nutrition, now the term is replaced by therapeutic nutrition. It has a therapeutic intent rather than only the maintenance. Now the two or three slides on protein. Protein, it is uh, totally agreeable that 1.2 to 2 gram per kg body weight is usual requirement in your most of the patient, more than 80 percent of the patient. Even it is more in case of burn and trauma patient. So if you look this different article, Early high protein intake is associated with low motility. But if we start early high overfeeding, like more carbohydrate based feeding, motility increase. So in first few days, it is the protein which is more important. Similarly, this study is also suggesting provision of 1.2 gram per kg protein may be associated with lower motility in tube fed as well as mechanically ventilated person. Now the feeding dilemma, problem is there. You can see in the right hand side picture, enteral nutrition, either by nasogastric, duodenal, nasojejunal, gastrointestinal, whatever the things, and parenteral by either central or uh, peripheral SS. But I am giving you the example, when Ashwarya Bachchan was get admitted in a Bridge Candy Hospital under our respected Faru Kudwadiya sir, she is denying for the IV channel also. I will not do, sir. This is a panning and all, scar and all. I will not accept. For GI dysfunction, after two days, they are asked for a tube feeding. Ma'am, I have to tube feed, otherwise it will be malnourished condition. You are not at proper health. She, she simply asks, I cannot avoid any scar in my nose. If you say it may be, 
even I would like to die rather than getting a scar. So we know that enteral is good, enteral is a start, but you have to look after the patient also. You cannot force your patient. So simply, some of the complications also you have to keep in mind. Putting the tube in the bronchus, even ethmoid process, through the ethmoid process, you can go into the brain also. So you cannot altogether avoid that nutrition, enteral nutrition is best. Similarly, parenteral is also uh, come with the complication like thromboflavitis, skin necrosis and all. And this is an environment putting up the uh, TPN through the peritoneal dialysis line, causing peritonitis, a lot of complications in this way. These are rare, but you have to keep in mind. And definitely you don't want refeeding syndrome, that is hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, leading to QT prolongation and VT. Rare complication in ICU, but yes, it is a fatal complication. Now this is a recent guideline in surgetic perspective, surgery perspective that is ESPN published in March 2021. <clears throat> I would like to put two or three slides. Is perioperative fasting is necessary? No. Recommendation in most of the cases you can feed your patient up to six, before six hours up to surgery and two hours before surgery, anesthesia, clear, fluid, clear liquids you can give in most of the condition if it is not contraindicated otherwise. And preoperative carbohydrate concept. You give carbohydrate, in this study they have shown 800 ml before night, surgery night, and 400 ml before surgery, does not increase the risk of aspiration. And your outcome is better because you are increasing, by increasing the carbohydrate preoperatively, increasing the insulin level, so the metabolic stress will be less. Similarly, immuno nutrition, grade B recommendation, it is not recommended isolately, but yes, if your patient is exclusively in TPN, you may have to use immuno nutrition. Similarly, the ONS, Oral uh, nutritional supplement, yes, we have to give this oral nutritional supplementation, supplementation if you are preparing for a large surgery or you are discharging your patient in a malnourished state. Organ transplant, yes, rules are almost same. Even after the small intestine transplantation, you can start nutrition early. In solid organ transplant, you can start internal nutrition by 24 hours. and. Long-term nutritional monitoring is very, very important in this transplant patient. And recommendation for living donor, recip uh, donor and recipient is nothing different from the major organ surgery. Bariatric surgery, usually early oral intake is not, uh, early oral intake is recommended. PN is not required. Hypocaloric nutrition is the part of treatment. But in some complication, you may need tube feeding. Now my last two or three slides. This is a recent advancement in the nutritional part. Role of phytonutrients in nutrigenetics, nutrigenomic in the perspective of curing the breast cancer. This is the latest article published in the Biomolecule 2021. They suggest, suggested that phytochemistry, nutrigenomic and nutrigenetics have provided strong evidence that certain phytonutrients are able to modulate the gene expression at transcriptional and post-transcriptional level, and such phytonutrients may be beneficial to prevent the uh, prevent and treat the breast cancer. Although it is not come, but it may be in future trend that you will may, may, may get some benefit from the new phytonutrients itself. And last slide, that is the artificial intelligence. You put all the data from the patient perspective, what is your nutritional goal, they will guide you. So along with this artificial intelligence, also you can make some input to your patient. So this is the take home message. That is, nutrition is mandatory. It cannot be option in your patient. It, it has to keep in mind, enteral nutrition is always preferred. But as I have given an example of missing versus Esperia Rai, you cannot force everybody for enteral nutrition. This part also to be considered. Supplemental parental nutrition is to be considered after 24 hours. If you are unable to achieve your goal by 20% of your target, enteral and parental nutrition should be seen as an option, two options, rather than two different poles. So there should not be any debate no longer should be debate, rather it should be a synergy between the enteral and parental nutrition. So, as I have told initially, this balancing of enteral nutrition is an art along with the science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully I am in time. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk on this uh, very less uh, discussed topic. Uh, so I, I would I like to initiate the discussion. Sir, uh, in the patients uh, if, uh, which come to you, uh, do you routinely uh, assess for micronutrient deficiency also? And uh, for macro and micronutrient deficiency, what are the tools which you use? Yeah, <coughs> very, very relevant question. Uh, 
very first day you don't go for the micronutrient deficiency estimation. But when you are making a subjective global assessment by taking the proper history and physical examination, some obvious physical signs if you are good. Suppose you are simply seeing the glossitis, lab report showing the low hemoglobin. Definitely you are thinking for the uh, iron, folic acid and all. So, uh, protocol is in such a way that it will cover your micronutrients. But for the therapeutic part, we usually consider after three to five days or three to four days or when you are present in a prolonged parental nutrition or enteral nutrition. In that case, it's specific, otherwise you have to supplement. There are preparation, separate preparation for the micronutrient as well as the macronutrient. But for the immunonutrient, I have told, it is a grade B recommendation till uh, for now. Uh, thank you, sir. As, as you've told, we don't have uh, our national guidelines, but probably the IAPN, which is the Indian uh, Association of Parental and Nutrition, yeah. they'll be coming up with guidelines soon, uh, maybe next year. The GI co, co group is working on uh, the guidelines for surgical patients in India. Yeah, hopefully we'll be more wiser with the guidelines. Any questions? Yeah. Feed or home food? Uh, feeding feed, formula feed, or uh, like uh, kitchen feed, kitchen. like that. Now I must tell you that kitchen feed has absolutely no, 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 no means because uh, it is a second option always. Formula feed is more scientific, more balanced. Uh, you can make it like hypocaloric, hypercaloric, whatsoever. But if you are preparing a kitchen feed, you cannot be perfect. Cannot be perfect. So, if I have to choose one of them, enteral feeding with the formula feeding is always recommended. But in resource limited setting, or if you are unable to provide cost effectiveness, then in the second option, you only think for the kitchen feed or what you call homemade food. If there are no more questions from the floor, uh, thank I'll you. thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir.